All right, hello everyone. My name is Phil Winder and I run a business in the UK that specializes in doing um, production data science. So we're fingers in quite a few pies, but one of the pies we've got our fingers in is something called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is a, a tool or a, a technique um, that kind of derives from machine learning. And it's a really new and interesting way of solving um, a certain kind of machine learning problem. So this presentation is all about uh, providing a, an introduction to that in a code-oriented way. So this, this presentation is primarily for, for engineers, for people that like looking at code, that like tinkering with things. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's very specific and not very abstract, so it's, it's very uh, in-depth, in basically. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do is I'll, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction and then we're going to dive into a Jupyter notebook. And at the same time, you can load that notebook and follow along if you, if you like, or you can follow the screen as I, as I walk you through it. We have about 30-ish minutes, um, so I have to be quite brief and quick going through that document, unfortunately. Um, but hopefully, it will be enough for you to, to get a, a, an understanding. If you could type any of your questions into the chat window, that would be great. Or if you just leave the questions till the end, that's also, that's also good, just so we don't sort of break the, the, the thread of the talk. Um, yeah, and with that, I'll, I'll get cracking. So the main reason why I have written this presentation is that it, it is an accompaniment for my new book on reinforcement learning. It's being published by O'Reilly and it's being released in about three weeks time, hopefully. It's just gone to the printers uh, a couple of days ago. So, so now it's, it's uh, going through all of the, uh, the processes that, that need to, to happen in order for it to get released and printed. Um, there's an accompanying website, rlbook.com, rl-book.com. And uh, on this website, you'll find all of the, the extra materials that, that didn't make it into the book, you know, all of the examples and things like that. Um, what I recommend is that you, you go there and sign up and I'll uh, you know, send you details of when the book is released and free chapters and, and things like that. So yeah, you can find more details about the book on there. Uh, so yeah, this presentation is, it, it comes from that book. It, it, it delves into a very small part of that book. There's far more details in the book, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, hopefully it's still gonna be interesting. So let's, let's try and uh, explain what what reinforcement learning is for those that don't know so far. So I like to find good examples of reinforcement learning and they usually, they usually come back to um, the way in which we learn, humans learn, because it's a, really good, it's a really good representation of what we're trying to solve here. So reinforcement learning is learning by reinforcement. The name is actually really good for once, um, which doesn't, doesn't happen very often in, in data science, but the name fits. And, um, one example of learning by reinforcement is learning how to ride a bike. And a couple of years ago, I think at one of the GoTo conferences, I, I, I saw uh, Destin uh, Sandlin give a presentation about uh, a bike that his friend had made him, which inverted the steering on a bicycle. So if you steered left, it turned right. If you steered right, it turned left. Um, just with a couple of gears on the, on the post of the, of the bike there, as you can see. And when he tried to uh, go ahead and ride this bike, then you can imagine that it's, it's incredibly difficult because it's not what you're used to. You've learned, you've spent your entire life learning how to ride a bike and then this bike comes along and it does the opposite of what you expect. So as soon as you try and sort of counter falling off a bike, it instantly goes the wrong way and throws you off. So there's, there's a funny video of, of him falling off his bike many times. Um, and the interesting aspect of this is, is when, he, when he played the same trick on his son, his son was able to learn much quicker than, than he was how to ride this inverted bike. And this is uh, just a, you know, a screenshot from the video with his head chopped off. But um, his, his son was, was able to, to learn how to ride the bike really quickly. Um, so this is a, a sort of an, a, an example, really, of, of how you learn in, in the first place and how it's hard to learn new tasks once you've, you've, you've learned the optimal strategy for, for doing that thing. But it all boils down to this. Um, when you 
when you see a bike for the first time, you have to experiment to learn how to ride it. You can't, somebody can't just tell you how to ride a bike. You actually need to try and do it in order to learn. And what you're doing there is when you sit on that bike, you can see and sense and feel, um, you know, many things around you. You can, you can see the grass, you can feel the pain when you fall off, you can hear the sound of the gears grinding, things like that. And that, that, is, um, the, that represents the state of the environment. So all of, the, all of that information is the state of the environment that you're currently operating in. Okay, so that's this arrow coming here. Um, here at the bottom, we've got this box called agent. An agent in this sense is you, it's the person. The person is the agent because they are the one that's responsible for, for taking in this state, for, for absorbing all of this information, and then suggesting new things to try. And you do that by suggesting actions. So for example, steer left, steer right, brake, pedal, things like that. And those actions get fed back to the environment again. So when you steer left, for example, um, that will change the state of the environment because you might have fallen off your bike. So previously you were looking at the horizon and now you're looking at the grass. Okay, so the state of the environment has changed. And over time, when we repeat this loop again, and again, and again, and again, we also obtain some kind of feedback, some kind of reward that represents the, well, represents how well we are doing at that task. So in, in terms of riding a bike, the reward could be negative. It could be that you've fallen off and you've, you've hurt yourself, or it could be positive and you're getting a, a clap from your parents. Um, and, and over time, you learn to maximize this reward. You learn to avoid all of the negative things and, um, you know, try and obtain all of the positive things. And uh, this loop goes round and round and round. You never stop learning. You never, you never stop learning. And, and, and ultimately, the, the agent, this thing at the bottom, it, it, it is able to, um, you know, store or memorize some kind of strategy for dealing with that particular situation. And when we see similar situations, again, we can pull out that same strategy and try it again. And in most cases, it works. You know, if you get on a different bike, it generally works the same way. Um, you know, un unless you uh, unless you go to to Amsterdam or somewhere and have like these hub uh, these these bikes with uh, hub brakes in the back wheel, where you have to pedal backwards in order to brake. There's no there's no handlebar brakes, so it's like the first time you have to do an emergency stop, and you suddenly you do this, and there's no brakes, and it's like ah. Oh! Um, so in general, it works quite well, but when you turn the steering around, then obviously that strategy doesn't work anymore. And you've got to restart this process again. You've got to train yourself and, and, and form a new strategy. Um, so that was just a, a description of how we, we, we learn on a bike, but this has been generalized and formalized into something that mathematicians called a, a, a Markov decision process, an MDP. And this presentation is about encoding this MDP in some Python code. And rather than learning to ride a bike, we can teach an agent to do different and interesting things. Um, okay, so let's move on to taking a look at the code now, because uh, we've got about 20 minutes left, so that's, that's great. Um, what we've got here is a link to a GitHub repo. So if you browse to tinyurl.com forward slash RL code notebook, that should redirect you to a GitHub repository. In the README there, there's two buttons. And what I'd like you to do is to click one of those. It doesn't matter which, but this will open the notebook inside a notebook hosting service. Um, it's pure Python. There's no libraries, so it pretty much should work anywhere. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and open up that notebook now. and. So everyone can see it. Why have you reappeared? Go away. All right, I'm going to open the, the Colab version. Oh, let's solve that. That wasn't me. There we go. And in a few seconds' time, we will see a full on Jupyter notebook. So I've written this notebook so that you can use it and read it without watching this presentation. So there's a lot of text in there. There's a lot of 
explanatory notes. Um, of course, there isn't as much detail as there is in the book, but uh, hopefully there's enough to get you going. I'm going to skip over all this text and uh, get straight to the code um, because we haven't got too much time. So what we're going to do is we're going to code up this Markov decision process. Let me go back to that image before. And uh, we're going to simulate our own environment. So ideally, you want to do this in the real world. Ideally, we want to be able to control a bike. We want to, you know, sense all of the things around that bike. But it's, it's, it's actually, it's quite hard to do that in practice. Um, it's quite expensive to do. Um, and it's, it's hard to iterate. It, it's, it's quite yeah, slow work. So typically what engineers do when they're tackling these kinds of problems is they, they build a simulation either from past data, from log data, or from first principles. So what we're going to do is build a very simple environment which consists of um, a 2D square. And within that square, we're splitting the environment up into cells. And we're going to have an agent inside there which is allowed to move around the, the 2D space. So basically it can move like a, like a piece on a chessboard. It can move around these different cells inside that, that square. Um, and in the literature, that's typically called a grid world environment. Um, I start off by defining some core types. We have two core types here. One called a point, which is uh, just a, an XY coordinate of that 2D space. Um, so zero, zero represents the bottom left-hand corner of that chessboard, if you're thinking of a, a chessboard. Uh, and then we have some directions in which the agent can move. They can either go north, east, south, or west, up, down, left, or right. Okay, nice and simple. Next, we're going to start encoding the environment. And we're going to do that by creating a class. Uh, called simple grid world. We can specify the width and height of the grid world. And we're setting the actions that the agent can take within that space. And we're just saying that the agent can move in all directions, basically. Next, we've got this reset function. And this is required because MDPs come in two forms. Basic MDPs can come in a continuous form where this loop never ends. It just goes on forever. It's, it's an infinite loop. Okay. But there is a, another type of MDP, which is called an episodic MDP, which means that one of these states is a terminating state. So basically you go around in that loop until you find a terminating state and then it stops. And then we need to reset it back to some starting position again. Typically episodic MDPs are easier to work with because um, there's, there's a finite amount of time in which uh, an episode can run. Um, but, but some problems are necessarily uh, continuous for, for, for reasons that um, depend on the, on the problem. Okay, but in this case, we're going to work with an episodic MDP um, because it's easier to visualize, it's easier, easier to, to, to conceptualize what's going on. So this reset function is resetting the agent back to the starting position. And here I'm defining the starting position as uh, x equals zero, which, so that's the left-hand side, y equals the height. So basically the top left-hand corner. I'm fixing that starting position every time. In a real problem, you might want to consider randomizing that start position to explore more of the, the state. Then I'm setting the goal, and the goal I'm setting to the x equals the, the, the width, so the right-hand side, and y equals zero. So this is the bottom right-hand corner. So the goal of this environment is basically to go from the top left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner. Nice and simple. Then we've got a function called step, and this step function actually implements this interface. It, it, uh, it implements this interface of providing an action to the environment and returning a state and a reward. So you can see here in the, uh, the parameters, we're passing in an action, and all of this code is basically just controlling the transition from one state to another. Um, yeah, it's, you know, for example, if we, if we pass an action um, of direction north, if we tell the agent to go up, then we're, we're, we're basically just incrementing the y counter for that 
uh, for, for, for the current state. Okay. So that's just a quite a bit of just, yeah, it's probably cleaner or simpler ways of doing that, but, but it's just controlling the internal state. Then we're checking to see if the agent is out of bounds, if it's out of bounds. So if it's moved off the board, we just move it back on. We just put it back to its previous position. So from the outside, what the agent will, what it will look like is that the agent tries to, you know, uh, move off the board, but it can't. Then we have uh, a flag here to check to see whether the current position is actually the goal. So to see if the agent has reached the terminating state. And finally, we, we are specifying the, the reward. And this is actually a really crucial part of the design process. So the reward encodes the goal of the optimization. Here we're setting it to minus one, which means that we're negatively rewarding for every single movement. For every movement that it makes, we're saying, no, bad, bad agent, like try not to move. Um, and what that will do over time is that encourages the agent to take fewer steps to get to the goal. If we just set this to zero, we're effectively saying you can move freely, you can, you can do what you want. If we set this to a positive value, then we're actually encouraging it to move more. So yeah, this is really important. And in more complex problems, it can, um, uh, a lot of time is spent tuning and designing this reward to suit the problem that you're trying to solve. Okay, and then we're passing back the current position, the reward, and this is terminal flag. So it's really important in any data science uh, uh, discipline to visualize your data, to visualize what is going on. Um, and it's no different here. So what I've done is coded up a function to present a visualization of that environment. And it's quite simple. It's just a, a big print statement. It's just outputting some text. And I'll show you that in a second. So now let's just test all of this code. So I'm instantiating the class here. This is our environment class. And then I'm passing an action to the step function repeatedly. So I'm sending south, 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 east, 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 east. So when we run that, what we'll do is because we turn this debug, debug flag on, we'll get this printout of the environment state. And here you can see a single character for every single square on that board. We've got a five by five square. So we've got, you know, yep, five by five, five lines, five, five characters. The X represents the agent. The, zero, the O represents the goal. And when we pass in the action and call the step function, you'll see that the agent has moved down, it's moved south, and it's moved south again. And each time it's returning this uh, from the step function, it's returning the, the new position, the new state, it's returning the reward for that action and whether this is terminal. So we're gonna keep moving south, we're gonna keep moving south, now we're at the bottom, can't move anymore. If it tries to move south again, it'll just stay exactly where it is. But it will still, uh, it will still receive a reward of minus one for trying to move out of bounds. Um, then we move east, 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 and eventually we get to the terminating state. And that's represented by an at symbol when the, the agent is on a terminating state. And now our flag is, is, is set to true. All right, so we've got an environment now. What do we do next? Well, the next part of the problem is what, well, what we think about what we're trying to do. We're trying to, um, you, typically we're trying to find a way of uh, getting to the goal. We want to try and achieve some goal and we want to do that in the best way possible. The definition of best and, and optimal is entirely dependent on that reward function. So in this particular occasion, what we're saying is that we want to try and get to the goal in as fewer steps as possible. So what we need to do is try and write an algorithm that, um, uh, that achieves that. One of the simplest algorithms that you can write is something called uh, the cross entropy method. And that's a bit, of a, a bit of a fancy name, but it's quite a simple algorithm and it, and it, it can work quite well, and even in complex scenarios. Um, the idea is, is that you randomly explore an environment until you reach a terminating state. And you do that many, 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 many times. Over 
uh, a long period of time, eventually you happen to randomly stumble across a, a strategy or a trajectory to a goal that is actually quite good. So in this algorithm, what you do is you repeat that many times and then you look at the final reward and you pick the set of actions that produced the best reward. And then you just repeat those set of actions. And that is then your optimal strategy. Um, so that's all well and good. And it, it's very simple and it's simple to code and it's a really good baseline because it does tend to work quite well in, in many situations, but it's not particularly intelligent. It's not really using any knowledge or um, it's, 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 not, it's not using the information provided by the environment to further optimize those trajectories. So one of the um, earliest and um, most fundamental algorithms is something called a, a Monte Carlo algorithm. And Monte Carlo is a, a statistics technique, which is, is very similar to what I just explained, where you are randomly sampling. You're randomly asking the environment to provide you with a sample. And over time, you can build a really good picture of, the, of, of, of how that environment actually um, how that environment works, basically. So Monte Carlo techniques are trying to sample many times and build a picture so that we can then guide the direction in the future. And one way of doing that is to quantify the value of being in a particular state. So if we just go back to this picture here for a second, and um, here's our chessboard. Think of this as a chessboard, and think of that bottom right-hand corner as being a goal. We know that it takes a reward of minus one to, to move a single square. So if we are in any of these states that are in that bottom right-hand corner, then we know that we can actually, sorry, not, yeah, we've only said north, south, east, or west, actually. So we have to move to the left or down in order to get there. So actually, it's only two states. If we're in any of these two states that are next to the, the terminating state, then it only takes one step to get there. So that means that there is a, 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 an optimal action that we can choose in order to get to the terminating state, and it will reward us with minus one. And so in, in this state, it will be south, and in this state, it will be east. Um, and for those two states, then we know that if we just pick the action with the highest reward or the highest expected reward, then that's going to lead us to the terminating state. So what, a Mon what the Monte Carlo algorithm does is it tries to visit all of these states and it tries to see the value of moving in every single direction. Because obviously if you're in this, if you're in this state here and you move to the left, then actually that's not very good at all because you're going to have to loop around and, and, and take many more steps to get to the terminating state. So the value of going to the left, to going west, is, is very low. But the value of going to the right, going east, is, is very high. All right, hopefully that makes sense. So the first thing that we need to do is code up an, um, a, a piece of code that allows us to generate these trajectories. So this, this class and this method here is um, a bit of code to uh, choose a random, you see the, the random library there, a ra choose a random action um, whilst it's not terminal. So it's just repeatedly picking random actions and it keeps doing so until um, it reaches a terminating state. And when it does that, it results in an array of um, action choices and, and also states as well. And you can see in this particular run, this will be different because it's random every time, but in this particular run, it chose to go down, then up, then up, then left, then left, and down, and so on. Um, and this represents a single trajectory for a single episode. So each, each item in here is one step. This is a full trajectory, and uh, this is a trajectory for, for one episode. And the total reward for this episode was minus 10, so that's actually pretty good. Um, because it's moving randomly, it can take a very long time sometimes to actually reach the, the terminating state. Um, so that's actually a pretty good run. And then once we do that, I'm just going to skip over that, that section for, for a second. What we then want to do is we want to try and quantify the value of each of those states. So one way of doing that is calculating the average reward observed 
um, for each action, um, uh, uh, well, back from the terminating state. So um, what we're doing here is we're taking a trajectory, so just like the array you saw earlier, we're reversing it, so we're starting from the end, we're starting from the terminal state, and then we're working backwards to see how many more steps it takes to get to the, to the, uh, to the goal. And then over time, we can average out those average um, uh, rewards and hopefully build a picture of, on average, how many steps does it take to get to the termina terminating state from this particular state. All right. And obviously, to do that, we just need a couple of dictionaries to store the raw, the raw values, the raw, um, uh, the raw, yeah, the the raw re rewards and uh, how many times we've actually visited that state. So we just keep track of that and then calculate the average here. Right, so when we run that, then we end up with this you know, quite giant 2D grid where for every single square, we have an array of four things that represents the value of each action. So remember, uh, let's just go back to, let me just find yeah, let's just use this square for a second. Um, so if this is the terminating state, then the, the state that's just to the left of it will have four elements in there. It'll have four actions with four values. And the action that is saying go east should have a value of minus one. Okay. And so that's what I'm printing out here. I'm printing out the, um, the raw action values for that particular state. And you can see that we've got north and then east and then south and then west. For the east, we've got a reward of minus one. Perfect. Um, so that's what you'd expect after many, many, many runs. So obviously, again, we're still, we're still dependent on random sampling here. So it may not actually visit that action or it may not even visit this entire state for quite a while. So what we need to do is run that for many iterations. I ran it for a thousand iterations and it ended up with this. This is a plot of the average expected return, the average expected reward for all actions. So this is saying, and, and yeah, so basically this is answering the question, what is the value of being in, in a particular state? And you can see that the values tend to be lower the closer they are to the, uh, to the terminating state, and they tend to be higher further away. So now what we can do is we can generate an optimal strategy by looking at all of those actions and saying, which is the best action? So that's what this bit of code is doing here. It's trying to find the best action. And you end up with a plot that looks like this. Every single square now has a best action attributed to it. And all of the actions are generally pointing towards the um, terminating state. So they're all generally kind of guiding you no matter where you go in the right direction. But remember, this is still due to random sampling and it's quite noisy, especially far away from the terminating state. And so if you look here, look at those two states, you've got one that says go down, but then the next one that says go up. <laughs> so this is just going to end up in some kind of infinite loop going up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, but if we ran this for longer, you would hope that it would average out and the policy would get better. But there are far more sophisticated algorithms that avoid this problem entirely. Um, but this is a, yeah, a, a simple way of kind of introducing what an, an optimal strategy or an optimal policy actually is. All right. So I encourage you to go through that and play with it and tinker with the code. And, and ideally, if you really want to get a good intuition, actually code it yourself. So start from scratch um, and you can do all sorts of things. You could try increasing the size of the grid. You could, uh, you could add holes in the middle, to see what happens. If uh, the agent falls down a big hole, add some walls, add a cliff at one side, change the reward value, things like that. See what happens. Um, and I'm just going to go back to the presentation now just to finish this off. And I wanted to sort of bring this back to the real world a little bit. Let's skip through all this. Yeah, I wanted to bring this back to the real world because this seems really, really simplistic. And in, in some ways it is, um, but there, there are applications that kind of fit very well to this, to this idea of simulating this 2D space. So one example that is quite common is when you're working with geospatial 
domains. Um, there's there's one paper on the on the website. Uh, so on the website, sorry, just to recap, there is a whole section dedicated to uh, industrial applications of reinforcement learning. One application on there is it talks about optimizing um, taxi routes according to a, a geospatial grid in in New York and. Um, the idea is, is that if you can tell the taxis to go to the right square at the right time, then people are able to get a, a taxi whenever they want, less traffic, less congestion, more earnings, more efficiency. This is another example which could use a, 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 a discrete state. And I think this example is really cool. This is an example of a, a HTML styled inbox. There's, there's lots of other HTML styled things that you could you could do as well. And the state is the actual HTML code. The action is a CSS selector. And the goal is represented by a text string. So the, the idea here is that you will say a command, say forward the email from Kyle to Anna. And uh, the agent over time, by randomly sampling all of these actions and these states, will learn how to you know, forward an email to Anna by using the, the right CSS, CSS selector. And this is just a, a quick GIF so showing that in action. We've got the goal at the top. We've got the, the actions that the agent is choosing and it's writing some text and it's forwarding emails um, and stuff like that. So that's a really good sort of tech example from the tech industry um, that uses a discrete state. So it's not that unrealistic what we've been doing. All right, just a reminder that this has touched the surface and you can find a lot more in my new book on reinforcement learning. Um, if you are attempting or wanting or thinking about using reinforcement learning in industry, in, in your job for your company, then I'd really, really like to talk to you uh, about that more. So please do get in touch, windowresearch.com or just, you know, any, any way you can um, search for me and you should be able to find me. <laughs> And with that, I've run out of time and uh, I'll hand it over to questions. Thank you very much.